Sure. We are live. <laughs> All right, welcome, welcome, folks. It's Thursday, February 4th. Mm -hmm. Hope you enjoyed your couple days off here. And we're uh, working on the nervous system, working toward taking a test. Uh, St. Ed's has some, again, Catholic school week stuff going on today and tomorrow yet, so I'm recording both days. Actually, we have kind of a semi-regular class today, but I think a shorter period again. Uh, so I'm recording for them. I also had about six or seven people gone first period for the jazz thing, watching the military band, army band or something. So um, they will be watching the video too. So anyhow, we'll, we'll put the video on the, on the St. Ed's uh, website. There's a teacher with and the better on there. So it'll be there. Um, otherwise, welcome, welcome. University of Iowa, uh, Carver College of Medicine, is coming to Fort Dodge on March 30th, I thought was the date. This is the 29th. I think it's the 30th. Uh, the 30th. But um, this is a part of what they do with the STEM activity, science, technology, engineering, and math. All right, students uh, will explore the science of cancer and the research taking place relating cancer by bringing in a uh, professor, some hands on activity. Current medical student will help students explore human anatomy by observing real human specimens. I don't know exactly what they'll be bringing, but they're inviting students to take part. They're also bringing in some other students to help coordinate this. So we have a uh, yeah. It is Tuesday, March 29th. Okay. So Tuesday, March 29th, they'll be coming. Um, it says there's room for 30 to 45 students. So I, I know some of those people from first period that were not here today would probably like to sign up. But this will be from 10.30 until noon, more or less, uh, down in the auxiliary gym. And if this is something that you would like to take part in, please sign your name here and pass that around. Uh, you don't have to. But if you would like to take part on that day, it will, you know, it's a long ways from now. But we're trying to coordinate what students are coming and that type of thing. So uh, I imagine there'll be uh, it says one faculty member, one student, and then some other medical school staff members will be there. So it's a great opportunity to uh, hear from the University of Iowa, hear some research is being uh, is taking place there. So. If you're interested, sign up, please. Otherwise, uh, a couple things in the news here. Uh, this one doesn't necessarily relate to the nervous system, but in the last couple days, there's been more and more research about the immune system and how this might apply to C-section babies. Okay. Um, decent number of babies, more or less a third of babies now are, that are born are born by C-section, which means for whatever reason the baby does not come down through the normal vaginal birth, through the normal birth canal. Um, usually it's some sort of trauma connected with mom or baby or whatever, or whatever. but they uh, uh, do surgery and take the baby out. Well, it's been known for a long time that uh, C-section babies often necessary to ensure the health and safety of both mother and child uh, can have a lasting impact on the child's health. C-section deliveries have been associated with increased risk of asthma, allergies, obesity, and, and immune deficiencies. Why? What is there different about taking a baby surgically that's going to affect it years down the road in terms of allergies and such? Well, it's been suggested that at the moment the babies emerge into the world, a host, and we, we keep talking about bacteria as being bad guys causing disease. Well, there's a whole lot more bacteria that are good guys, okay? And a host of beneficial bacteria begins to colonize 
in their digestive tract. And research shows that bacteria plays a very important role in terms of their immune system. It's a part of what's called the microbiome, micro living, okay? The bacteria living in our body suggests that it's essential to the human health. Well, that introduction of bacteria normally happens to the baby as it comes down through mom's birth canal, as it's exposed to vaginal fluids in there, okay? And C-section babies don't get that. So, researchers are looking at giving C-section babies the microbes they're missing and hopefully some of the health benefits by swabbing babies born by a C-section with mother's vaginal fluid shortly after birth. Okay, in your first thought, you're looking at me like, really? Okay? Um, it, it's a good thing. Okay? So this research is being done in New York School of Medicine and other places. Um, they are collecting samples from 18 infants and their mothers. Some of those babies were born vaginally, some were born by C-section. Within minutes of birth, four of the infants born by C-section were swabbed with gauze that had been in the mother's vagina for one hour prior to delivery. Okay? Uh, bacteria quickly colonize a number of body, body sites and change during the first month. So anyhow, they're working on this study thinking that this is going to help the immune system. Uh, this, I read a different article about this just in the last couple of days where it said that um, a, a researcher who was involved in bacteria said his partner, not I guess maybe not necessarily his wife, but his, said his partner gave birth to a baby and would he secretly, without telling anybody about it, just because of his research and because of his background, swab his C-section infant with the mother's vaginal fluids. Um, he did this not as a part of the research, and this, that's the, that was the news article I read over the weekend, and uh, just the idea that he thought that was going to improve the health of his baby. Interesting. Okay. Are you following the Zika virus? My mom is. She told me she got some virus. It's been she, on the news a lot. It's been on the news a lot. Yeah. And we've talked about the Zika virus spreading uh, by mosquitoes, okay? And the hope is that I'm not sure right now if those mosquitoes are going to live in the United States. If they would, it would be in the southern United States, not where we are. But there's now been a patient in Dallas, Texas, and the, uh, the patient had not traveled to the infected areas but their sexual partner had just returned from Venezuela. So it appears that it was spread through sex, not necessarily just through the mosquitoes, which turns out to be a little bit scarier again. Okay? Um, might be a little early to call it a state of emergency. Vitamin that tastes like a mint. The response so far? Very positive. But uh, uh, this is turning into a big deal. Right? A real big deal. And it's not done yet. It's not even close. I uh, read another article over the weekend. That, uh, Zika virus is spreading out of Florida, where the governor has declared a state of emergency in four counties. And ground zero for the outbreak, Brazil is struggling to contain it, with prominent voices now calling for this summer's Rio Olympics to be canceled. Our Dr. Richard Besser is on the scene in Brazil right now. Good morning, Rich. Good morning, George. Every four years we look forward to the Olympic Games and the world coming together. But this year it's different, and that's why health officials are so concerned. Because when the world comes together during a viral epidemic, when people go home, they may not go home alone. With millions of tourists in Rio for the start of Brazil's carnival tomorrow, and millions more expected this summer for the Olympic Games, controlling the Zika crisis here is more urgent than ever. Overnight, Brazil's president saying the virus has gone from a distant nightmare to a real threat. The government scrambling to start developing a vaccine, but until one is ready, she says, mosquito prevention is their best course of action. Now this morning, 
some who doubt whether Brazil can get Zika under control by this summer, are calling for the Rio Olympics to be canceled. I don't know that it's up to doing the Olympics and epidemic control at the same time. Mosquitoes are a tough opponent. The U.S. Olympic Committee tells ABC News it is keeping a close eye on the situation and that Team USA participants will be made aware of the CDC's recommendations regarding travel to Brazil. Especially for Olympic athletes like Michael Phelps, whose pregnant fiance is among the most at risk population. Zika has been linked to a severe birth defect, microcephaly, when pregnant women get infected with the virus. While the U.S. women's soccer team is focusing on qualifying for the Rio Olympics, head coach Jill Ellis tells the Dallas Morning News the Zika outbreak is concerning. Over the next two weeks, Brazil has a trial run for what crowds can do. It's carnival season, so visitors are coming from around the globe, and it's also mosquito season. When people return home, we'll see what happens to the Zika epidemic. George and Amy? Well, that is scary. It certainly has a lot of questions to answer there still. Rich Besser, thank you so much. Obviously, they have spent billions of from vitamins uh, preparing for the Olympics. Billions. And I'm going to cancel the Olympics because of this. Could they just move it somewhere else? Or right. is that not, not easy to do, to have all the facilities and all the coordination and all these things. I mean, you, the, the, this site was identified, I don't know, probably eight or ten years ago. Yeah, that, that'd be difficult. I, I, don't, I don't know that you could do that on that short of a notice. Um, anyhow. All right. Well, we were talking about the meninges and the spinal cords. As the bell rang, we were talking about uh, children's spinal reflexes. We'll come back to that and we'll work my way that direction, but I'm going to take the shirt to rest to get there. As we were talking about the meninges and the spinal cord, uh, the meninges and the cerebral spinal fluid, we said that is there to protect and cushion the brain and spinal cord. And the injuries that you're protecting against would be, for example, concussions. Okay? Concussion. Traumatic brain injury that alters the way your brain functions. Typically, the effects of a concussion are very temporary. Headaches, problems with concentration, memory balance, coordination. How many of you have had a concussion that you know about? There's some hands going in the air. Okay. Is it possible you've had concussions you don't know about? Mm -hmm. Sure. No. And not everybody who has a concussion has permanent damage. I just want to say that first off. Not everybody that has it has permanent damage. Okay. Uh, they can occur with a blow to the head can also occur when the head is violently shaken, okay? Can cause a loss of consciousness, but most concussions do not. Because of this, some people have concussions and don't realize it. Common, contact sports, football, soccer. Most concussive traumatic brain injuries are mild, and people usually fully recover. We used to, tease isn't the right word, but play down concussions, okay? Uh, persons in uh, football, and there's a hard tackle, and you'd say, boy, that guy got his bell rang. Boy, he didn't know where he is right now, and he's, you know, he's kind of stumbling off the field, and we'd kind of say, yep, well, and be out for a few plays and maybe back in the game. Has that thinking entirely changed? Yeah. If you're a football official, if you're a football coach, if you're an athletic trainer, if you, uh, and even basketball, even track, you know, track athletes, you don't think about them getting concussions. But we, there's a video that's on the uh, uh, association, the Athletic Association website. We watch that video and we have to be updated on the protocol, how you deal with, with concussions. And if you've had one during a ball game, you know the kind of questions that a, a trainer's going to ask you. You know, uh, you know, what is your name? Where are you right now? What's the score of the game right now? You 
know, count backwards from 100 by sevens or something like that, and ask you to do some things to see what you can do. Okay? And do you have a headache? Uh, temporary loss of consciousness? Confusion? Feeling fear in the fog? Amnesia? Dizziness? Seeing stars? Not every time you're dizzy, not every time you see stars that are in a concussion. Uh, ringing in the ears, nausea, vomiting, slurred speech, any of those kinds of things. In the days following that, then it's contrary, uh, concentration, memory complaints, irritability, personality changes, sensitivity to light and noise, not sleeping right, psychological adjustment problems, depression, disorders of the taste and smell. Okay, uh, Those are some of the longer term things that can happen afterwards. With kids, it's a little harder to tell, okay? Um, years ago, a lot of years ago, we're uh, traveling up through northern Minnesota to see my brother, uh, lived in Canada. And uh, we stopped at, it was called Two Harbors, which was a place along the highway where you went down this hill to uh, Lake Superior. It was kind of like Dolliver Park kind of place. And um, well, it was a lake instead of the Nguyen River. So we just took a break with the kids and let them, you know, stretch for a while, get out of the car and stretch Sunday afternoon. And I had Julie in the backpack. She's six months old. And the kids are throwing rocks in the creek and splashing and playing in the water, just a little bit of water. And they're playing. And uh, uh, a rock lands right beside me, and Julie starts crying. Hi. Thank you, thank you. Uh, don't have this person. Oh, yeah, I do too. I couldn't <laughs> read it. I do have this person. And uh, Julie starts crying. I looked at the kids. What happened? And I don't know if it was Andy or Christy. They're five or three and five or whatever age. I'm sorry, Dad. What happened? I hit Julie with a rock. I don't know why a rock's flying in this direction. <laughs> but take her out of the backpack. She instantly has this goose egg. Okay. We're 15 minutes from the car. Okay. We're another 15 minutes from the closest town, and it's Sunday afternoon. Okay. And it's a small town. So we hustle up the hill, you know, and there's no bleeding or anything, but just this big goose egg. And we happened to find a clinic with a doctor that was there on a Sunday afternoon. And you know, this is a half hour later. And she's settled back down, and she was eating and everything okay. Uh, the doctor said, well, the good thing is, he said it came to the outside because the skull is so soft, it swelled to the outside as opposed to swelling on the brain. He said, not much we're going to do for her now. And, was, and we had iced it. So said, just keep an eye on it. And if you see any changes, you know, how do you see changes in a six-month-old? You know, they, they sleep and they poop. You know, I mean, that's kind of what they do. You know, eat and sleep and poop. And uh, so we just kind of kept an eye on her. But Oh my goodness. <laughs> Traumatic <laughs> brain. <laughs> For you folks in St. Ed's, we just lost some snow off the road here. But, uh, anyhow. So these are the kinds of things that we look for, you look for in the infant. Okay? And, you know, crying and loss of balance. Well, she wasn't walking yet. Changes in eating, sleeping patterns. Days, blisslessness. Yes, ma'am. Um, when I got my concussion last year, it rattled like the balls in my ears, and then it gave me vertigo. So you were dizzy for a while, yeah. then. Yeah. So what was it? What was it from? Uh, concussion. I mean, from. <laughs> oh, I hit my head on during the soccer game. Soccer game. Yeah. Uh, on somebody else's head or heading the ball? No, on the ground. On the ground. Yeah. So you just <laughs> smacked it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they've talked about it in the NFL now changing, most of them are playing on turf and putting more cushion in the turf because a lot of head injuries do come from the helmet slapping. And you're going to hear a lot about this, you know, with the Super Bowl this weekend and all of that. Um, 
causes make pretty good sense. Some sort of rapid acceleration or deceleration in the brain and the head. Okay, the car crashes. Okay. But brain injury of this sort may lead to ble ble bleeding in or around the brain. And that bleeding can be fatal. Okay. There's greater risk in football, hockey, soccer, rugby, boxing, those kinds of things. Car accidents, bike accidents, soldiers, explosions where you're violently thrown up against something. The victim of abuse, falls, all those kinds of things put you at greater risk. The treatment is rest. Okay? And uh, the problem is, no matter which level it is, let's, let's go back to that football thing again and, and the movie, Concussion, came out here this fall. Anybody see the movie? Okay. But uh, the movie came out this fall and, and it was picking on the NFL pretty hard. Okay? Um, probably right, rightly so. The NFL has made a lot of rule changes now to limit the hits, and you see that in the college game too. Okay? Um, the NFL is in a financial position where they are being sued for head injuries for many years back. That, you know, they, and then so the rules have changed now so that pretty much any sort of head to head sort of contact, any sort of violent contact, um, guys kicked out of the game real fast. It just happened in the playoffs last week. Okay. And you can argue, you know, quite often it's the wide receiver out there or it's the running back and he's tackled head to head kind of thing. Uh, maybe the, the quarterback is throwing the ball and somebody comes in head to head and gets him. Okay? Um, but in those kind of situations, the player comes out of the game, how you doing? Well, he knows if he gives the wrong answers, what's going to happen? He can't play. He can't play. Okay? Are you having headaches? Nope, I'm fine. <laughs> you having you having um, memory problems? Nope, I'm fine. And quite often, athletes, no matter what age, high school, college, pro, whatever, athletes are encouraged to lie because they know what's going to happen if they give the wrong answers. And so that, I mean, they, they don't know they're going out of the game. Um, so that it makes it a difficult one. Okay, but that rest. Avoid general physical exertion, no sports, no physical activity, no vigorous activities. The rest also includes mental rest. Limiting activities require thinking, mental concentration, playing video games, watching TV. You think you can watch TV? That's you can't even watch TV. Yeah, that's what they recommend. Schoolwork, reading, texting, computer, shut all that stuff off. So the rest is not just the physical, but it's also the, the mental activity. And, uh, resuming sports too soon increases the risk of a second concussion and of lasting potentially fatal brain injury. Okay. So who does this bring to mind? Just in the last few days, another announcement. Tyler Sash. You know his story? Out of where? <coughs> Iowa. Iowa. Oskaloosa, <laughs> Iowa. Okay? And uh, good looking guy. Notice he died last September, September 8th. Okay? Uh, played for the Hawks, played for the Giants, was drafted in 2011. Had a pretty good career for Iowa, and uh, professionally played by the Giants. Member of the Super Bowl championship squad. He was suspended after testing positive for uh, one of the banned substances. He said that he took the drug legally and under a doctor's care for an anxiety condition. Okay. He was an all-American boy growing up. 
an All-American boy at uh, Iowa. Okay, and after his professional career, things kind of started changing for him. Arrested for public intox, interference with public acts. People said that was nothing at all like him. That was not his style. They said he would never have done that kind of thing. Eventually, he was found dead in his home at 8 o'clock in the morning. And the autopsy reported his death was caused by a mixture of drugs. And they were a mixture of pain reliever drugs, is what they, were, what they were. Okay? And he was just diagnosed January 26th, just a few days ago, five months after his death, he was diagnosed with CTE. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy, okay, from blows to the head over a period of time. If you cross paths with CTE, you've heard about it, read about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Repeated blows to the head. Okay. Um, difficulties in thinking, emotions, behaviors that maybe do not become noticeable until many years later. Now, not everyone who's had concussions develops CTE, so we don't have to go there. But the more concussions you've had, the more likely you are to have this. Um, it's a progressive disease, and what's called a neuro, neurodegenerative disease, neurodegenerative disease, and it causes visible changes to the brain. The diagnosis of CTE is not made until after death. It's from an autopsy. So, you know, later in life you can suggest, well, maybe this person has CTE. Okay, but you can't make a positive diagnosis until an autopsy after death. This was originally called punch drunk syndrome. Um, Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, that name mean anything to you? Mm -hmm. Cassius Clay as a young man was quick, good looking, and boxer, champion type of thing. And he was applauded, he was rewarded for standing with Joe Frazier and just, and they just took turns beating on each other. Okay, and, and some of his fights were, I mean, you kind of got, oh, I can't watch this anymore. Kind of thing, you know. Kind of the equivalent of what a lot of people are doing in the cage fights and those kinds of things now. Okay. But uh, he was punch drunk and he finished out his years not knowing where he is. I, he's died, I think, now. But he finished out his years not knowing who he was, where he was, what he was doing. He was probably one of the many CTEs that some for boxing. But it uh, doesn't have to be boxing, doesn't have to be football, it's anything, military personnel, okay? Researchers do not yet fully understand the prevalence and cause, and there's no cure, okay? Um, you're at risk for CTE if you've had a lot of blows to the head, okay? No matter what the reason for the blows. Um, there probably are some genetic risk factors because not everyone who has C, not everyone who has lots of blows to the head has it. Um, over the weekend in preparation for the Super Bowl, there was a doctor and he was probably a little bit out there, but he said that in his, in his estimation, anyone who had played professional football was at risk for CTE. Okay. And it wouldn't be too hard to stretch that back to a college level. Age, stress, alcohol, substance abuse may also contribute. Okay, so there's lots of variables, and it's not well understood yet. Um, not a lot of treatment for it. Okay, um, we're going to encourage you if you've had symptoms to do all these same kinds of things. Cut back on activities. Get the rest. Says avoid the computer time, that'd be the same thing, avoid the cell phone time, you know, the, whatever you're doing on there. 
ease back into work. Don't make major decisions. These are people that are used to being in control and making up their own mind about what they're going to do. Calming environment, reassuring responses, modified tasks. It does encourage regular exercise and eventually games and thinking activities. It says that bedtime is often the worst. Tyler Sash was born, found at 8 o'clock in the morning. You know, so maybe he went through some sort of depression or whatever at night. I don't know. I don't know. Anyhow, comments there. A lot of people that play football now are kind of changing their thinking. And you hear a lot of professional football players, and now they're playing with their little ones. And the question is asked, are you going to let your kid play football? Not sure about that yet. But I'm not, not picking on football. It could be soccer. It could be you know ice, ice hockey. You go to Minnesota, you get thousands and thousands and thousands of kids all playing hockey. You know, so it could be any sport where there's risk of that kind of injury. So that kind of tied into the meninges. Meninges are supposed to be protecting against all those kinds of things. Okay. We talked about the meninges of cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, we talked about Spinal taps, lumbar punctures. We talked about spinal anesthesia. Okay. We were talking about reflex arcs. We said reflex arcs uh, typically protect you against quick events, stepping on a nail kind of thing, touching something hot. You pull your foot off, you pull your hand away. Uh, the information comes from the sensory directly into the spinal cord comes back out to the muscle, you pull your hand away before the brain has thought you're getting burned or you touch something sharp. So it's, for the most part, they're a protective sort of thing. Um, as the bell was ringing, I think we were talking about the newborn reflexes. Mm -hmm. We didn't quite get those finished. And I don't know which ones we had talked about here. Um, we talked about the rooting reflex, I think. Yeah. You stroke your cheek and you turn toward it. Come on. We had it on grass. Come on. And uh, so we talked about the rooting reflex the sucking reflex, and that's important for feeding, okay, obviously. We talked about the startle reflex, uh, I don't know where we get to, the walking reflex, the grasp reflex, we get there. Uh, I think this is maybe the last one, the tonic neck one, the fencing one, okay. Writing reflex, this says, and I'm not familiar with this one, but it says drop a blanket, gently drop a blanket over your baby's face, she'll automatically shake her head from side to side and flail her arms until it falls mm -hmm. off. Again, it's a protective sort of thing. Okay, it disappears toward the end of the first year. Okay. Tongue thrust reflex. You put something in your baby's mouth, you know, like a like it says, talk about tip of a spoon or something, touch their tongue, and they'll push it back out. And that's a way at, at that stage they're not old enough to eat solid food. So this is a reflex that protects them from keeping things in the mouth. The solid foods, obviously, they don't know how to chew or any of that kind of stuff yet either. Okay. Withdrawal reflex. If your baby's sitting contentedly in his bouncing seat, suddenly bring your face close to his. He'll quickly turn his head away in another attempt at self-protection. Okay. So does that last a lifetime, or at least until that cute chick from algebra zooms in for a kiss? But, you know, Okay. Uh, all right, spinal cord. Spinal cord injuries.
There's the brain and spinal cord. Traditional thinking says that if a spinal cord is damaged, if it's completely severed, you're going to lose motor and sensory below that point. Okay? It's kind of like a whole series of wires, millions and millions of wires, the wires being those neurons, and if you cut the spinal cord, you're going to lose everything from that point down. There's a little thing here called a dermatome map. And as you look at a dermatome map, it's showing you where these neurons come off. And um, for example, if you sever the spinal cord up here at C3 or C4, Okay. Um, you're gonna, you might have a little bit of, well, if you're, if you're high enough, you're going to lose everything to the arms below that. If it sever at C6 or C7, lower in the neck, you might have some movement or some sensation from the fingers, limited use of the arms. But if this thing is high enough up here, you are going to be a quadriplegic, quad meaning four, and you're going to lose the use of arms and legs both. If the damage is lower in the thoracic area, para means two, you'll be a paraplegic where you'll have the use of the upper body and motor and sensory from the upper body, but nothing in the lower body. Okay. Um, Christopher Reeves. Superman, right? Good-looking guy, actor, got the world by the tail, until what happened? What happened to Christopher Reeves? Fell off his horse. Severed his spinal cord, broke his neck. Now you can break your neck. If you, if you break your neck, that means you broke the bones. That may or may not do any damage to the spinal cord. But in his case, he severed the spinal cord, as you see up here, the quadriplegic, so we broke it very high. Okay? No motor, no sensory from that point down. Okay? Paralyzed the rest of his life. Um, as you can see, he's in a wheelchair. 100% um, care is needed uh, on, a on a respirator. A lot of his pictures you see, in some of them you actually see the tube coming down here. Here you actually see the tube. A lot of his pictures after his accident, he has a real high collar on. And that collar is coming up, he's breathing through a stoma right here. And eventually started to be weaned off of that. But see the heads being held in place because even the muscles are holding the head up. And of course the issue with this is his, his brain is perfect. His thinking process, his memory, all that is perfect. Okay? Um, the people that start calling the shots and controlling things at this point in time is the insurance company. Because initially, you're going to go through some physical therapy. And if you don't start recovering, if you don't start making any improvement as a result of that physical therapy, the insurance company says, you're done. You're not showing any improvements. We're done paying for physical therapy for you. you know, here's your wheelchair. 
and this is how you're going to be the rest of your life. Okay. In his case, um, as it's you can't you can't quite read the fine print there, but it says Reeves discussing stem cell research. Okay. In his case, he was able to get a lot more physical therapy because of his money, because of his influence, because of his position. He was able to get a lot more physical therapy than what we would get. Okay. And as a result of that physical therapy, he started to get a little bit of movement in his toe, I think it was. Is he a little finger or two? I think it was a toe. He started to get a little bit of movement in the toe. And that was not predicted. Okay? The thinking was, you know, that spinal cord severed. It doesn't heal itself. Yeah, hoping stem cell well in the future. But no. But because of that intense and years, years of physical therapy that he got, he did start to see a little bit, of, a little bit of feeling in a toe, a little bit of control of a toe. My grandpa was a quadriplegic. Was he? Yeah, and um, he regained feeling motion in his hands. What did they say that was from? They don't know. I mean, because I have no idea. But he's how, how many years later? Um, I think it was a while, quite a while later. Like probably. Six or seven, probably. Six or seven years? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, and that, that wasn't predicted, I'm guessing? No. No, it wasn't predicted. And in some, you know, in some cases there is, was he doing anything special or just adapting to life? Um, that and he was doing physical therapy and stuff because my grandma was working and trying to afford all the medical bills and he was oh. actually a sports writer, so he could type and work at home. So I think that was like motivation for him. Cool. Is that the one in Louisiana? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, you see his wife there. Obviously, you think about how her life changed when her husband became a quadriplegic because he needs 24 hour care. Somebody has to be with him all the time, has to take care of all of his needs. Uh, by the way, he died of uh, basically bed sores which he didn't feel, okay? Um, what did he do? Compression ulcer, uh, uh, bed sores. Just from being in the same position in the skin pushing against something solid and uh, he got infected and that's what he died of, which was, should not have happened at all. That was weird. But uh, shortly after he died, his wife died of lung cancer and she was not a smoker. That, that's weird too. You know, now it's more good to die alone. Yeah, here you go. You look closely at that. Have you seen the wheelchairs that have the little straw in them? He was able to use his breath to control the movement of the chair. Have you seen those? It gives some level of independence. We had a uh, one of the fellows, Jim, is his name, that I work with at, at Drake Relays um, in our crew. He, um, Jim was from Oklahoma, really liked track, liked the Drake Relays. He was a lawyer, and he volunteered to come up and work at Drake every year. He'd come up and work Thursday, Friday, Saturday at Drake, and then go back home. And there were two or three other people came up from Oklahoma with him. That was just kind of their little spring trip. They came up and worked at Drake Relays. And probably four or five years ago, three or four years ago, um, Saturday night after Drake, they were uh, going out to eat. They were staying with a, the mother of one of the other guys there. They stayed with her. They were going to eat and go home the next morning. And so he, uh, they were going out to eat. The other two guys sitting in the front seat had seat belts on. Jim was sitting in the middle of the back seat, just a regular car, and uh, uh, going up just to, not out in the country, not on, not going 60 or something, but just to in town, and the car's coming at him, and the driver said he just saw this young kid, teenager, looking down. He didn't know, I don't know if he was texting. I don't know if I ever heard the end of that story, but initially he said, yeah, he was looking down and just came across the road, drifted across the road, and got him. These two guys were caught by the seat belts and the airbags. Jim was sitting in the middle of the back seat. He came up over the seat 
and crashed down on the floor of the front seat and severed his spinal cord. He was quadriplegic for the rest of his life. Uh, when I'm seen when he was in the hospital in, in Des Moines, he was there for know, four, five, six weeks until he kind of stabilized and eventually, uh, well, I saw him like four or five days later and he was extremely depressed, which I would have been too. Because again, up here, everything works fine. And you can't get messages down. You know, and he was used to being very active. Uh, the good part of the story is, as a lawyer, you need to use his brain. You know, and he is back doing lawyer jobs now. In fact, I think he's a judge of some level. So his, his brain is working fine, and he's able to get himself to work and do some jobs, okay, which certainly has to give him a feeling of value and a feeling of worth. All top floors that have not done their registration, please go to room 8. All top floors that have not done their top registration, go to room 8 at this time. Thank you. But anyhow, all right, we're getting into the brain. Next step's the brain. Uh, I don't know that you need to write down all of these functions because we're going to hit all these things again. We're going to break this up into the different parts of the brain and talk about all this again. But interpreting all the sensations, I don't think you need to write these down. You get different smells. You get different touches. Your perception says, is that a good smell? You interpret, is that a good touch? Is that a bad touch? Right. Memory, obviously, is coming from the brain. The reasoning power is coming from the brain. Making decisions, coordinating all the muscle activity, regulates all the visceral activity, all the internal organs okay, are controlled by the brain. And of course, that's where your personality comes from. You have a, uh, a diagram like this, I think, in your red book. And you'll see this diagram on the test. Okay. I'm not sure, once you grab your red book, I'm not sure if this is labeled the same way it is in your red book. You may have to compare this to your text to see if it's labeled the same. probably start by following the spinal cord up. And the first little bump he hits the medulla, then you hit the pons. So the medulla would be six, the pons would be five. Four is the diencephalon, which is a combination of two and three, which is the thalamus and the hypothalamus. And I read it, they don't label those up here. I don't know if which I got one's another. Which? Uh, yeah. I don't know that I've got a picture that doesn't come up. Yeah, here it is. Here's the diencephalon. Whichever one's higher is the thalamus. Hypothalamus is below two. it. Two is the thalamus. Okay. Two and three. Two and three, all right. So two is the thalamus, three is the hypothalamus. Okay. Um, and uh, we've got a cerebellum back here. What number do you have for that? Twelve. Twelve. Okay. What else do you need? Cerebrum. Cerebrum. All right. There's different numbers. They're, they're pointing at the gyrus and the sulcus, and I don't care about those. Mm -hmm. So. Spinal cords number seven. Mm, we don't have the corpus.
Corpus Closum on there, do we? Uh, yeah, there's the Corpus Closum. Number 10, maybe? 10 for the Corpus Closum. All right. Um, the cerebrum. Let's start there. This makes up about two thirds of the brain. This is the largest part of the brain. It's divided into two hemispheres, two halves. I'll, uh, I'll pass this around. This is a real live dead human half brain. Please be kind of gentle with it that you don't drop it. This is obviously the lateral view. There's the medial view. Okay. Okay. So you're welcome to pass that around. Did I tell you, did I, did we mention, I forgot if I talked about this or not, they were doing brain transplants on the University of Iowa. It was kind of a new thing. And so there was a guy went down, he was talking to the surgeon and said, uh, I see you're doing brain transplants here. Uh, I'm kind of thinking that I need a new brain. Mine seems like it's kind of worn mm -hmm. out. Can I get a transplant? I said, yeah, it, it's an option. I've got to tell you, though, it's pretty expensive. Well, how expensive is it? Well, it depends on where we get the brain from. Okay. Well, what are your choices? Well, if we get the brain from a high school science teacher, those are obviously not worth much. Those are kind of fried. Okay. Those are $10 an ounce. We get, we get a lot of that, that level, but we get a lot of those. Oh, what's my next step? Well, we have some professors on campus here that are done with their brains, okay? And those are $25 an ounce. They're a little more expensive, they're smarter people, okay? Is that the best you got? No, we can also get you the brain of a University of Iowa football fan. And those are $100 an ounce, 